name is Jonathan Yonan. I'm the headmaster at St. David's School here in Raleigh. We should not take for granted that there is a space for public discourse at St. David's. The free exchange of ideas is not an automatic priority in any society. It's something we must always work to preserve in the face of many headwinds. We learn by trial and error with each new generation. Listening and speaking with each other is hard. Revising our opinions is uncomfortable. And this is exactly why St. David's has placed such a high priority on learning how to have important conversations. This is we, why we have prioritized a semester, I'm sorry, a seminar-oriented humanities program. This is why we focus on leadership. And this is why we don't just want students to know the what, but also the why, and to learn how to keep on learning. Without conversation, our ideas are never tested. Without conversation, we're not stretched beyond the limits of our own experience. Without conversation, we cannot discover our own peculiar blind spots or the special insights of others. We all, students and parents, need a place to come together and explore important ideas. St. David's is committed to conversation, to public discourse, and to making space for our amazing young emerging citizens to cultivate bright and agile minds. Our speaker series is a unique program among our independent school peers, and we are proud to offer a compelling roster of public events this year, exploring the arts, economics, leadership, and parenting. For the full lineup for our 2021 speaker series, you can check out our website, stdavidsraleigh.org. And I wanna in particular thank Sarah Merriman, who helped make this specific event happen. I also wanna acknowledge Chrissy Barr, Gil Greggs, Lee Stallings, Mary Allison Raper and her team, Emily Nelson and her team, all of whom have worked together to make this year's amazing speaker series possible. So welcome to the 2021 St. David Speaker Series. I hope you enjoy. I'm going to introduce two people for this event in particular. Uh, I'm first gonna introduce a colleague of mine, Miriam Leshnock, after whom I'll introduce Nori uh, Panisi, who uh, will give us a presentation. So Miriam Leshnock is the Assistant Headmaster of Finance and Operations at St. David's. And she and Nori are going to have a fascinating conversation at the end of Nori's presentation. Miriam has served at St. David's for 10 years. Her academic background includes a bachelor's degree from Chapel Hill and an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania where she studied at the Wharton School. In Carolina, she was a varsity ladies volleyball player. She's also married to Don, who is a professional baseball player. She and Don have three wonderful uh, daughters who are all student athletes, and Miriam has coached for many years. So she brings a lot of experience as a parent, as an athlete, and as a coach to the table. Nori Panisi is a mental skills training consultant. She was a varsity tennis player and a Moorhead Kane scholar at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Over the years, she's taught and coached at the middle school level. She's a practicing mental skills training specialist. She works remotely, holding a position of special projects coordinator for the Institute for the Study of Youth Sports at Michigan State University. And she advises coaches and parents and athletes, uh, both at the novice and the elite levels. Of course, she's also a parent. So she has real life experience in rearing sports oriented children uh, as they grow up. Nori will be presenting on the topic of supporting your student athlete, talent development in the age of COVID-19. Again, remember to stay on all the way through to hear a conversation between Nori and Miriam. But without any further ado, Nori, welcome to St. David's. Welcome to the St. David's Speaker Series. I'm Nori Panisi. I wanted to open with this ancient fable there was this farmer and who had a horse, and one day his horse ran away. And the neighbors came over and they were say, saying, oh my goodness, that's so terrible, that's awful, uh, you're so unlucky. And the farmer said, good or bad, hard to say. 
couple days later, the horse came back with seven wild horses. And the neighbors came over and they said, that is so great. You are so lucky. That is so good. And the farmer said, good or bad, hard to say. Well, a couple days later, his son was riding the horse, and one of the wild horses, and he got bucked off, and he broke his leg. Oh, the neighbors came over, and they were saying, that's so terrible. That's awful. Now you don't have help. And the farmer said, well, good or bad, hard to say. Well, a couple of weeks later, the government decided to go to war. And so what happened was they came to each house, and they were drafting the boys, well, they saw the young boy, his son, with a broken leg, and they passed right over him. And the neighbors were like, that is fantastic. That is so good. And the farmer said, good or bad, hard to say. So it, this is a great story, given the, the, the events of COVID and things that are going on in our society today, how there are events. And we're so quick to label things as good or bad. We want to put it in a concrete box. But sometimes when we put things in a box, we limit them because we don't know what's just around the corner. I think it's a great story about faith and that God has a plan and God has us and that we have we just need to keep going on our journey and, and he is going to take care of us. I always say don't let the highs be too high and the lows be too low. You just keep going regardless what happens there is an opportunity there and if we don't judge it and put it in a box and say this is terrible this is awful and get stuck there we can open up ourselves to seeing the opportunities and we just see things as just events they're just events that happen if it's not okay yet it's just not the end it is always okay in the end. If you think back to a time where you you really struggled with something, I bet you're not struggling with it as much today or it's past, or you may still be struggling with it. But in the end, it's always okay. So I think about this when we're thinking about our student athletes and what has happened to them and with their some their seasons have been cut, you know, um, some the clubs aren't practicing. We lost a lot of time, and what we do, what are we doing for these athletes? What are we, what, how can we help our kids who are athletes? Because it is an important part of um, their lives if they play sports. But it's also as if it, they do anything. You know, a lot of things stopped. Even music was stopped for a bit until they had virtual education stopped for a bit. And it's a new normal now. And so... I wanted to talk about talent development and how there's these phases of talent development that for student athletes, for athletes that they go through, but it's for anybody, for any talent and even academics and musicians, they go through these phases of talent development. Um, as athletes move through through the phases of talent de development, the intensity of and the commitment and sacrifice and the effort goes up. So in phase one, you have this early phase. It's called different things. There's the introductory phase, the um, sampling phase, where you want, it's about fun and participation focus. This phase usually runs four and a half to about 10, nine and a half, 10. And so they spend time here. And this phase is where, as a parent, you want to give your child these opportunities to sample a bunch of different sports and play a variety of uh, sports so that they're, they're more multi-sports and you're not specializing yet, if you ever end up specializing. Then the second phase is the refinement phase, the transitional phase. And that runs you probably from 10 to 14, 15 years old. And in this phase, this is the middle year, these general phases, th this is where um, there's more focus on stressing values and the, you, they show a little bit more commitment. So you start practicing, you might get more um, coaching, more specialized coaching. They start practicing more, they get a little more focused in what they're doing. So in this third phase, the parents start backing off a little bit more on their involvement and they let the coaches coach a little bit more. You let your coaches be the expert and you're 
almost handing over your child in terms of their development for that. But you're still there. You're still very involved. And so the parenting themes through these three phases, the first one, what this sampling phase, that early year when they're playing a bunch of different things, you're trying to expose them to a lot of different things. It's fun and fundamentals. I mean, it, all three phases are about fun, but what's fun for a six-year-old is not always fun for a 14-year-old. And so you really want to think about that because, because going through each phase is a different opportunity. And the, the problem that we start seeing is that people want to skip those phases. And you have to fall in love with the game. All our, the literature shows that for anybody who to develop, they fall in love with whatever they're doing. And you have to let the kid fall in love. And if we, you go through and you skip the phases because you think, oh, they show so much potential, they should be training at a higher level or playing up at this level, you're skipping, you're forgetting about the developmental side. You know, there is a side to using sports as a vehicle to develop life skills. And I, it, it's important to think about as a parent, like, why do I have my kid playing sports? Like, I really think that's a really important question to ask yourself. Because if it, it is, I get a, some parents will tell me it's for a college scholarship, which is great. I mean, but, you know, less than 2% of people who play sports go on to play D1 athletics. Less than 5% go on to play in college anyways. But, and, and on top of that, you could take all that money <laughs> that you invested in sports in U sports and put that in academics because there's 300 times more scholarships in academics than there are athletics. So if you think about it, why do you have your child play sports? I mean, and you kind of really need to kind of think, well, why am I? Because it, it's going to guide your his whole his or her whole journey through this sporting process. A lot of people, I, the answers I get are to have fun, to get in shape, to learn how to learn life skills, learn how to work hard and be successful, learn how to fail and get back up, um, to be a good teammate, be a gracious winner, be a gracious loser. So at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to create, yes, this great athlete, this great student athlete, but truly what's our end goal? What is your end goal of having your kids in sports? And I like to think of it, if you can think of sports as a vehicle to create a better person, you know, a better adult who one day will go to heaven. I mean, I think that ultimately is the end goal. So it, it and we want to use sports as a vehicle for this. So in these phases, the parenting themes that we want to think about are in phase one, it's fun and fundamentals. Phase two, you're trying to um, become to emphasize these life skills because it's really important up till about 11 you're the most influential on your child you know after that it becomes the coaches and peers and so we we want to be making sure we're instilling these values into the, our children we don't want them being a bad sport we don't want them cussing on the court you know you want them to be good people i mean i would hope <laughs> you know at the end of the day but um so you're still involved. And then when you move to phase three, the parenting phase, you become less involved, but you're still supportive. It's kind of like thinking when the kids are young, below 10, they love to come up and hug you and kiss you. <laughs> you know, and I love that. And then 10 to 14, you know, we're hitting middle school. Yeah, don't kiss me in front of my friends. <laughs> you know? And then when you're older than that, hey, drop me off a mile down. I'll walk up. <laughs> you know? It's just it's the way it goes. But that's the same thing going through this talent development they just change and we forget sometimes that we need to change with them you know it's a natural thing we're so involved in the beginning but at some point we start needing to pull back and if you know your job as a parent if you're going to put them in these sports you want to make sure check it out make sure that they have the same values that you have that they're instilling things in these children these skills that they're going to teach them these life skills they're not going to it's not just about winning and that you invested into looking into the coach may you know kind of do your research uh, so you know so you can trust the coach as well i'm not saying don't ever have, talk to them and understand what's going on but you want to be able eventually to let go and let the kid take own 
his sport and own his own journey, okay? So when we go through there, these phases, there's three main roles that parents play. They are the providers, they are the um, interpreters, and they are the role models. They provide the opportunities. As a provider, you're giving, um, you give this support to them. You know, you drive them. You pay for it. <laughs> you you pay for the club. You pay for the team. You pay for the clothing and the equipment. You take care of the schedule. <laughs> you know, when they're younger, you might be the one taking care of the schedule and calling people up, making you know, checking what what time and making sure they're being picked up at the right time. Um, you're also if you provide also an active lifestyle you know if you're active they tend to be more active but you're providing these opportunities if they show an interest you know hey i I might want to try soccer sure let's see what we have out there you're providing opportunities that that's um really important it's an important phase it's not just provide you're providing the support but it's you're providing opportunities now the interpreter i think in the light of covid this is one of the huge the biggest roles that we need to remember that parents play. As the interpreter, kids will take on your sport, how you view sports, like how you view things as good and bad. (laughs) You interpret it for them, how you view a win or a loss. They tend to look through the lens of a parent. They they will adopt that kind of value and and what you deem as important. So if right now, in the age of COVID, this is terrible, I can't go to my kid's game, lucky for if you're, they have games, but they're not having spectators, you know, this is awful. Again, good or bad, hard to say on that one, because I'll talk to many kids that will say they're glad their parents do not come. But either way, the um, as the interpreter, when you, your negative and positive energy is transferred on to the kids. I mean, for sure. And we need to kind of remember that. Again, how you react to situations is going to, how you react to like your child's performance helps them interpret what success and failure is. Especially at a young age, like if you have a child playing flag football and they score a touchdown and you get so excited about the touchdown, you know, then they start thinking, okay, that's the success. Yes, that is great. But I'm also glad that you ran really hard. You ran really fast. That's something more in the child's control than the touchdown itself. You know, there's so many other factors that go into that. So we, especially in those early phases, you know, you really want to be thinking about that because it sticks. Like in swimming, I have kids when the um, parents, when they drop time, they're so excited, they get this cut, and then all along, and now I'm working with them as high schoolers, and the pressure's on for the parent, for the, for the time, just to try and get the time, and they forget that there's a lot of effort that goes into it. You want to interpret success and failure in a way, because they the kids will take, can take it on as pressure. And so just to be aware of that. The other role you play is as a role model, the other function, that you're a role model. Active um, parents tend to have active kids. Good parents who are good sports tend to have kids that are good sports. You're the role model. Have you ever been sitting in front of the TV um, watching a basketball game and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, the ref, that's an awful call. You know, not you, but maybe your husband or your wife. (laughs) Maybe. maybe. Um, And then 10 minutes later, the ref makes a call and your kid scream, that's an awful call, that's terrible. They follow you and they see it. And they, so it's important that we remember that one of our functions is as a role model. And so as we go through it, um, we want to think about like in phase one, some of the guidelines, so, you know, for parenting, you want to make sure you're instilling fun and fundamentals. That really should be the focus in that phase one. Remember that phase one goes from about four and a half to nine and a half, you know, around then. Um, You want recognize like your child's interest. So you want to support that. You know, you want to give them the opportunity. You want to focus little on winning and times, you know, um, more on things that are in their control, more on their effort or showing up and commitment, you know, running hard. Sometimes I work with kids and they'll, you know, they'll tell me, well, I just want to give my best. I, okay, well, what does your best look like? 
If you're on the field, what does it look like? And you have to kind of interpret that in a way that they understand. Well, if you run really hard, maybe I'm breathing hard. Oh, and then, you know, the younger kids will be like, yeah, my face gets so red and I can't breathe. That means I gave my best. And it gives them something tangible, something to look, you know, to say, I did do my best instead of, yeah, I did my best. And, you know, maybe the effort wasn't really there in your eyes. So, and then in phase two, it, you know, it's easier. They get a little more specialized in the sense they're getting more specialized coaching. And so in that sense, they're spending a little more time probably with the whatever sport it is, regardless if they're playing multiple sports or not. They probably might have moved to like a club level. They might be playing sports outside of school. And so with that, it's easier to make things fun in the early years. It gets a little harder. You're le- you know, in the earlier years, you're less invested. It's not as competitive. And now you do have these parents also that add to the competition as well. But again, fun is just different for te- um, a six-year-old versus a 14-year-old. And we, we have to work at that. And you've got to keep that kind of in your perspective. These middle years are critical because... Usually, it is like 80% of kids drop out of sport. 80% all overall of all sports drop out by 14 years old. 13, 14, which is pretty crucial if you think about like after 14, what's going on. We hit this little social phase, you know, we're starting high school. It's not necessarily because they don't like the sport anymore. They might decide they're not good at it or they don't want to do it anymore. But at this stage, you know, they go to high school after 14 and then you know maybe I want to focus a little more more on my academics but if I think about that that almost 80 percent of kids drop out of sports by then wow these middle middle years are really critical we did this one study on um tennis professionals where we looked at these professionals and where they went through and every single one of them these are the ones that made it all the way to pros um every single one of them in that middle years question about quitting and I you know so you want to look as a parent for patterns you want to make sure if they're taught they might hate it this week because the coach was hard on them or they lost or whatever it is you know but if it's consistent that they're consistently crying they don't want to go or they're consistent well now we probably have a pattern you know and then we need to reevaluate but sometimes I think if kids are just like I don't like it, you know, coach is so mean, whatever. I keep blaming the coach, not really, but (laughs) whatever, you know, coach is mean, players are mean, you know, and then next week they're, oh, it was so fun. Yeah, we just want to kind of go, you know, with it. And and, um, you just remember what you liked at 12, you might not like at 14. And so it just changes. As parents, you don't want to overreact or underreact. You also don't want to show that you're really nervous as well. You know, sometimes the strategies I teach kids to calm themselves down, like breathing strategies or squeezing and relaxing, we might need to do as parents because <laughs> it's really hard to watch your own kid. I have three girls and they all played sports and it's hard because you want your kid to do well. You want them to be successful and you you get nervous for them as well, but you don't want to show that to them, you know, because it's kind of saying that that sport is more important. Um, we did this great study on Olympic athletes where you had to have won not just one gold, you had to have won multiple gold medals. And a lot of the research showed that the parent, the ones that were really successful, the, the kids will say, well, I know they were happy when I won, but I knew they loved me regardless. Like, I, it didn't matter to them. You know, they held me accountable. Even though I won a gold medal, my mom still made me make my bed. That kind of thing. We want to be instilling values. We want to be instilling hard work, these life skills that are going to last for Forever, you know, yeah, take them into their whole adulthood so they can be successful in that way. Now, in this middle phase, this this phase two, you know, try not to coach. You know, when they're younger and they're just starting out, you might say, you know, on their forehead, oh, hold it this way or whatever um, for tennis. But as they get older, try and step back and just provide encouragement there and let the coach coach more. Um, some things you, you can say at this stage is like, so what'd you think, you know, if they have a competition? So what'd you think about it? 
and not fill it in with what you thought about it. And even still, you got to look at the timing there. Like, the post-competition car critique is the worst. <laughs> you know, sometimes they want to talk about it. Sometimes they don't want to talk about it. The dinner table critique <laughs> is really hard, too. I always say, let the kid talk about it. You can ask one question, what did you think? And if they go on and on, keep going. But then... You know, sometimes we just need to step back and let them process it. I find if you step back a little bit, it usually comes up later at, at some point. They usually want to talk about it. Some, some don't, you know, and that's okay, you know, because this is their world. This is their journey. That's the other thing we really have to remember. This is their journey. This is an hour journey. God's got a perfect plan for you, and God's got a perfect plan for your child. And whatever that is, we need to keep that in mind. And we need to remember, it's not us out there. We can't, one of the questions I always get, how do I increase my child's intrinsic motivation? Key there, key word, intrinsic. <laughs> we want it to come from them because this is theirs. I'm not saying step back and don't say anything because they still need you. They want you there. They want you to support them. So as we move into phase three, this is where you step back a little bit more. It's kind of like sending your kid to college. You're not involved necessarily in the day-to-day -day stuff, but the quality of your involvement when you're there is still strong. I'm not saying change your quality. I just might, my involvement is just changing. This is where you might let the kid travel with a coach. If, or if the team's going, the, you, they go and you might not go. It, it just is up to the kid in that sense whether they want you there or not. But you're lessening your involvement in this phase. Um, this is a big phase where you start, you still, again, same thing, stress basic values. Work hard. If you do it, do it well. Take responsibility for yourself and your actions. Um, let the coach do his job. So, and, and they start learning. It's hard because this phase, you're training, and sometimes training is not fun. And, it, it, you know, we all, you got to, you train to train, you learn to train, then you train to train, and you train to compete. And it, it, sometimes this deliberate practice is not easy. It's kind of boring. And that's why you got to kind of keep in perspective. Well, ask, why do you play? You know, why do you keep going? I'm all about after a season ends, ask them, do you want to do it again? Do you want to re-up, you know? And then if they make the commitment and they choose it, let them follow through on their commitment. That was one of the themes of uh, the Olympic study. The parents always made them follow through on their commitment. You know, if you signed up, okay, and you want to quit midway through, we're going to finish out the season because that's a great life lesson in general. Um, some of the best parenting practices, you want to focus on process goals. You want to focus on things that are within their control, okay? Things like winning, we know what it's also called an outcome goal, whether they win their time, is not 100% in their control. Yes, they have a factor in it, but it's not 100% in their control. They can go out and play the best game of their life and still lose. But if, if all along all I focused on was winning, they feel like a failure. So you want to make sure that you're focusing on the things that are in their control, their effort, the hard work, their, their um, showing up every day, their attitude. Those are the things that are within their control, being a good sport. You know, there's a story about Roger Federer in those middle years where he, he um, got upset with his dad and <laughs> he was playing and the dad said something or maybe moved in his seat, and Roger Federer saw it, and he said, why don't you go have a drink? That dad, after that, took those rackets. He did not play for a little while. I mean, he wasn't scared of disciplining for the kind of character that he wants. And look at Roger Federer now. I mean, he's the symbol of um, sportsmanship for men's tennis. So don't be afraid to discipline when you need to discipline. I talk often with parents who are scared well, what if they don't come back? You know, it's it, it, you, you got to remember your purpose. What's your goal? Are they really going to be that pro athlete? They might. I mean, they really might. It's a very small chance. But, but even with the pro athletes, even with the Olympic athletes, even with D1 athletes, the parents still emphasize these things. They still emphasize the hard work. They still emphasize the values. They still emphasize um, the sportsmanship. 
it wasn't all about outcome. Yes, we're absolutely excited when we win a conference championship. Absolutely. I'm not saying don't enjoy that, but be reminded it's because you put in the work. You know, they make an A on a test. You should be proud of yourself. You worked really hard for that. You, you studied many hours like that. So that's really good. Um, remember just to focus on that, especially at this time with COVID too. You know, there is a lot of uncertainty. The uncertainty leads to stress. And we tend to spin. Like, we can get our mind going and we will spin and we'll go around. And we have to remind ourselves, like, our anxiety will be manifested either physically or cognitively, either by thoughts or like my heart's racing or I feel sick, I want to throw up. And so the way I cope with that could be differently. Sometimes with a lot of stuff, it's our cognitive thoughts because I become so scared of what ifs. What ifs? Like, truly. I can live in one of three places. What ifs? What if this happens? What if, what if I lose? What if, what if we get sick? Whatever it is, it's in the future. It, it, it's truly in the future. What can I do about it right now? Well, I can prepare. I can prepare in certain ways. I can, um, I want to plan for the future, but I don't want to live in the future. Because I can't really do much about the future right then. The other place we tend to live, we live in the past. Especially right now. Oh, I wish it was. I wish it was like last year. I wish wish we could go to games. I wish we could do these things. You know, I, the problem with the past is really, what can you do about it? <laughs> Not much, you know. But we tend to live in these two places, either past or future. When the only place where we really can do anything is the present. And, and truly, in the present, and it takes a reminder to be back in the present. With COVID, you know, we talked about good and bad. There are some good things. You know, you probably got to spend a lot more time with your kids. You know, it's, it's stolen time. We, you might not have got it. The traffic's way better. You know, <laughs> so there are good things about it. And being in that present moment, not only in the present, being present, but it's your presence, like you having your presence, being present for your kids, you know, that's more important. That's where the love will come and the support. Um, the other things we want to think about in controlling the controllables, like when your, your, your thoughts, sorry, when you, not controlling the controllables, but when you have cognitive anxiety and your thoughts are going, you kind of, some of the times I want to teach kids about thought stopping, like you think of things that mean stop to you, like truly, if you can catch yourself spinning, what if this, well, if this happens and then you keep going, this thought stopping, this skill where you think of something that means stop to you, a stop sign. I worked with a college athlete runner and she would think of a red wall and you know of just a red wall but a stop sign and if I think of a stop sign you could tell me what color it was you could tell me how so how many sides it says you could tell me what it says <laughs> probably <laughs> how to read it and you just imagine that for a second stop but the key is where does that next thought go that's where I need to get focused on something else but if I have that in my um kind of in my bag like my mental skills bag of saying okay When I get like this, I'm going to stop my thoughts, and then I'm going to go to, I want to say, a happy thought or a good thought. If I'm working with an athlete, I usually tell them, go to your best performance. Go visualize your best performance. Start thinking about what what that was like. Visualization is key. Like you, the more details you can give an image, the stronger that image will be. It's kind of like you ever dream, you have this dream that you're falling and you wake up and it seems so real or somebody was chasing you and you wake up and it's like, ah, you know, kind of. It's because your brain thinks that's real. So if you can go to this place that was really great for you, a great time for you, it helps you to reconnect with that and takes you out of this spinning mode. So when you have kind of sometimes these irrational thoughts, if you can just stop yourself, that, that will help. Um, I think you, the key with when you want to support your kids through this whole process, it, it's treating your kids the same regardless if they win or lose. You know, regardless what happens, you want to treat them the same. Um, you know, you'd be happy for them. They're excited. And then, you know, okay, 
let's go get ice cream or let's go home. You have chores to do. <laughs> they love that one. So anyways, but hopefully all that helps in thinking about the different parenting phrases, like the best practices that you can do as your child, what, regardless of what stage where your child is today. But, and, and keeping in mind that the journey, like that they truly are, are on their own journey and that this journey is theirs. And you want to be there, be there to give them the best support and the best opportunity to be successful. So um, the other thing I just want to end with, with giving about COVID, you know, all these feelings that we have, even when things are stressful, we've got to remember that feelings are neither right or wrong. You know, feelings they, that they're just feelings. And a lot of times, oh, I feel bad that I feel this way, you know. It's just a feeling. Feelings pass too. You know, when you get real stressed, eventually you stop because you probably do something about it or you go exercise so you forget, you distract yourself. You know, these are the things we could help our kids with when they're feeling angry or really down about, you know, a loss of a season or being not, not able to play. We, we can help our kids with that. We can help them say, you know, give them empathy on it, let them feel it, and then know that that feeling is going to pass. Yeah, I totally get why you feel that way. It, it's hard. There's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's going on day by day, but we know we have today. And I think that's really important to remember. So every day at the end of the day, I'm all for a grateful journal. I'm all for you laying down and saying, what, what you're so happy at, what happened today? What happened today? I, I try and get kids to write down three things every day. I put a little journal by their nightstand and say, write down just three things. What you were happy, oh, I'm happy I saw my dog today, <laughs> or whatever it is, or I saw so-and-so today. And sometimes it's, I'm so happy this day is over, you know? <laughs> sometimes it's there, but inevitably the kids end up seeing what makes them happy? Oh, I really do like playing games with my family. And then they become more intentional. And then you start looking for the good things in the day because they're always there. It's just sometimes we get stuck in our little minds about them. All right. Thanks. Hi, my name is Miriam Leshnock. I am the Assistant Headmaster of Finance and Operations here at St. David's School. And I also have three daughters, like Nori, who attend St. David's. I have one who graduated last year as a freshman in college. And I also have the blessing of managing athletics. And so this is a, a really special opportunity for me since all of my girls played sports and still play sports. And I also played volleyball at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And in fact, Nori and I were there at the exact same time. So I have the, uh, the blessing to speak with you now and to ask you a few questions. Really appreciated what you just said. Um, a lot of great insights. I, I wish I had learned some of this um, <laughs> as a younger parent, uh, so, but still very helpful and um, would love to ask you a few questions. So we'll jump right in. Uh, you uh, were actually a Moorhead Kane at the University of North Carolina mm -hmm. and also played tennis, uh, varsity tennis. Yeah. And uh, so we would just love to understand uh, a little bit about the key factors that uh, made you the success that you are um, as a student athlete. A lot of luck. <laughs> it's a lot of luck. You know? Somehow I got that. But, yeah. I was really lucky. Um, I think what really helped me was my parents came from Indonesia, and so they were immigrants. They didn't know really the culture here, but they were tennis players. My mom was a national tennis player. My dad played Davis Cup for Indonesia. And so that side was always in our family. So they, that definitely was there. But then they also gave us the freedom to be, to immerse in this culture and be who we wanted to be. And so, like, I don't think they ever looked at a report card because they didn't know what a report card was. Yes. But And, in the, like, that didn't matter. So it was kind of driven from within you know the, the way they parented really gave us the drive from within and and it really was more about character you know how you respected elders and how you spoke that those types of things were instilled more than what I did in school but I, I think that really helped me was that freedom just to 
be who I wanted to be, you know. I, I think that that was important. And then my dad coached me in tennis, which ha was, you know, plus and minuses there. <laughs> definitely. I mean, he was definitely hard on me. But the other part of it, as a family, all three of um, all three of us played tennis, and we were always together. Like, we were always at the courts together. We always went to tournaments together. And I think having that family unit be so strong, we're all really close now um, as adults, which is so special. I think that really helped with my success. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a little tiny bit of competition in your family. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Yes. So, yes. But it, but it was good. I mean, it, it was good in a lot of ways. I mean, there was definitely some bad about it, but, you know, the challenges of having your dad and the expectations there. That was, that was hard. But it, his expectations truly were just for tennis. It wasn't academics. And so the academic side, I think, I just wanted to do. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, I just enjoyed it, I think. So, yeah. So, Nori, in your work with student athletes, what are some of the themes or the patterns that you have seen over the years, or even in the last six months with COVID, uh, where students have, have really struggled, student athletes have been struggling? So, right now with COVID, I, I think the biggest thing I'm seeing is disappointment. You know, it, during COVID, it, because so much was shut down, and the, the um, disappointment and then a lack of motivation too, you know, and feeling kind of lost. But, it, but I try and reframe that for them in the sense of, you know, it, it's like an injury. Like you had an injury, and you had to take time off. And it, so we got to think about what's your comeback story going to be? You know, luckily you really aren't injured. <laughs> but, yeah. but if you think about, like, what's your comeback story? Am I going to work? You know, we have today. I, I find a lot of kids are worried, well, I didn't do this. I, did, I didn't keep up with this. I wasn't. It. Okay. I mean, it's in the past. What do we have today? What do we need to do to get better today? And, and kind of think about it that way. That This is your comeback story. We, we took this break, and here we are. We're coming back. And so if the kids can, you can keep them kind of in the present a little bit more there instead yes. of, because I, I get a lot that are, I should have done this, I should have, and should have, would have, could have. We can do nothing about it at this point. So I think that's one of the themes I see. Another one is the parental pressure. Like, I think it's gotten a little worse, especially in terms of, like, specializing. I don't know if you know, but, like, there's very few sports you need to specialize early in. And, and as a society, for some reason, we think you need to go all at it really hard you know, oh, they're really good at this. They need to be doing this a, a lot and at the exclusion of other sports. But it turns out, like, there's a lot of research, even with D1 athletes, pro athletes, they played multiple sports through high school. You know, they did different things. Um, I'm not sure. Did you? Did you play multiple sports? I did, yes. Yeah. It was a big part of my development. Right. And, and I think it makes a difference. Like, coaches like that as well because skills do transfer. Um, not just physical, but mental skills also transfer there. But I think, like, the only sports you need to specialize earlier, like, where size really matters, like gymnastics or figure skating, those, those are the few that, that require that. Other than that, it's better for the kid to specialize later if they're going to specialize at all. Usually, like, nowadays the research is specializing at 15, which people are like, wow, that's really late. But actually, it helps with burnout. It helps with injury. It, it's totally different. Like, the, the pediatrics, orthopedics are all recommending specializing later. So I, I see one of the themes is that parental pressure, that kind of push to specialize too early. So... It's something to keep in mind. You know, I think it helps the kid in the long run, you know, if we can keep them a little varied. So it's very, very helpful. Good, yeah. good advice. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. Okay. So the next question is around the top three things that you should not <laughs> say to your kids as, as athletes, if you're, if you're the parent. Yeah. So what should you not say to your children? In my field, one of the death of a kid is to tell them they have potential. All of a sudden, that places this expectation, and you're constantly trying to live up to this potential. That's kind of ambiguous. Potential is just potential. 
it's up to the kid what he wants to do or she wants to do with it, you know, but to tell them they have potential. And it's like, oh, you know, because you see it. As a parent, you see it. You see, oh, you could be good, you know, but there's a lot of other factors that go into being good, not just that athletic ability. And so we've got to keep that in mind. Um, the other question is the why. Why did you do that? Why didn't you do that? <laughs> like a constant, I, and this comes up, my parents are going to be at me, and they're going to be, well, why are you acting like, you know, kind of. And it's like, well, why didn't you catch that ball? Why, you know, and that's probably not the best question. <laughs> because it's like, yeah, um, I remember it, it, in the past, like I was playing tennis and, my coach was watching me, and she said, well, well why did you do that? You shouldn't have done that. And I'm like, okay, but it's over. I'm still in the middle of a match here. What? I can't do anything about that. So that's one of them. And then the other one is um, bargaining and bribes. Like, oh, if you win or you drop time, I'll, we can, I'll get you this. You know, It just kind of destroys intrinsic motivation. It's, it really does. Even like if we think about paying for grades, like who's it really benefiting? You know, will they ever develop that love of learning? Just kind of thinking of in that thing, in that vein, like a, of, a, the, of a bribe. It, it just doesn't work. It makes the kid feel much worse because they don't develop it. You know, they don't develop that intrinsic motivation for it. And they're going for this extrinsic goal that, and it's based on something that's not always in their control. Because right. it's usually on an outcome. Be achievable. Right. Yeah. And it's usually an outcome. You know, it's right. usually what, what it's not in their control. And so, yeah. Well, again, very helpful as a mother <laughs> and, and as, a, as a coach. Yes, yes. So, Nori, that, that was great. And you are clearly a woman of faith. I, it, you, it was interwoven all throughout your talk, which was wonderful. Um, such a blessing to everyone who gets to hear it. Aww. And I've had the pleasure of spending some time with you as well and gotten to know you better. And so it's, it's just, it's nice to, to hear about your Christian faith and how that informs what you do. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, is really around how you, how you use that mm-hmm. to inform what you say to your students and to parents and, and how does it influence how you interact with them? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think faith is the center to everything. I can't imagine going through this life without faith, you know, without the hope in, in, in that. But it uh, it answers my why, you know. Why do you do what you want to do? Or why, you know, as we talked in the beginning about why you have kids play sports, what's our end goal? Like, truly, our end goal is to get to heaven, you know. You know, we want to all be in heaven one day and where there's all this joy and there's, you know, you can just praise God and the, there's no tears and just the joy there. And I think, you know, when you have that faith, it holds you accountable. You know, I, I believe I there's hope in that there is a bigger plan. Like, he's got a plan for me. I says he has a great plan for you. It's a great plan for your kids. And if we l- trust in that, the, the, the hope where we can go with that is so real. You know, it, it, it drives everything. And having someone bigger that holds us accountable to everything we do, you know, to what we say to people. And it's not just, um, I'm thinking about what makes me feel better. You know, it's, there's a larger picture to this because there is a God who created us and we're all children of God, you know, and I think that really drives me. And, and I, I do also think like, well, what are the gifts, you know, what gifts, I, it's such a blessing to work with all these different people, these different athletes, coaches, teams, whoever, you know, and it's like, well, you must want me to do something, you know, and so my prayer always, I always ask God to guide my words every time before I speak to anybody, and I, I th- I, I'm so thankful for that, like I, I truly am, and when I have an athlete that has a Christian faith, it's so much easier to talk about that there is a big picture, you know, and that you are being guided. You're doing, you know, God's giving you these great gifts. And then, you know, what you want to do with them is up to you and him. And so I think that really helps me. So I'm, I'm just so thankful. I can't imagine not going through this life without faith, you know. I, I mean, I know the same for you, right? Absolutely. And so we're just so 
appreciative to see how the Lord has worked in your life and how you're using that to minister to, to students and to coaches and everybody that you interact with, to parents. And we're just so grateful to have gotten to learn from you in, in your talk and the, just the biblical um, underpinnings too in terms of what you said. Um, a lot of great lessons for all of us yeah. as we parent and as we um, teach. And certainly it's a part of our mission, uh, faith, virtue, and knowledge here at St. David's. No, I, I truly appreciate you being able to come and even speak about faith as well and having it intertwined in, in this talk. I really appreciate you asking me to come speak. Well, we are grateful. So thank you so much, and I look forward to spending more time with you yes, in the future. Thank you. Teach you. me how to play some tennis. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Great. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you for watching the first installment of the St. David's Speaker Series. We look forward to having you join us again. Please check out the website to find out when. And we're so grateful to have Nori Panisi and all of her great wisdom that she has shared with us today. Thank you.